Isn't it great to be able to deliver good news? Have you ever had the opportunity, been in a place where you've been able to say something like, you got the job, or yes, I will marry you, or it's a girl, or something you know, like that. It's just so awesome to be able to deliver somebody good news. And here in Mark 16, we get the delivery of the best news ever. The best news that mankind has ever received in all of our history. We've been studying about Jesus, our ultimate action hero. And although Jesus died, he died physically, he died spiritually, the Father turned his back on him, he came back. And that's what we're going to read about this morning. He came back, and he came back in victory. He came back victorious over sin, over the devil, and even over death itself. But I love how Jesus does it. Right? If I am the ultimate action hero, I'm going to, you know, first of all, wear a cape, and, and I'll have a cool logo that Deanna will have designed for me. <laughs> And, and, you know, wearing a unitard or whatever it is that they do. No. But, you know, erase that off the tape. Get that picture out of your mind. Okay, so if I'm, if I'm the ultimate action hero, though, right, there's that big stone in front of the, in front of the uh, tomb there. What's going to happen? It's going to be like in an ultimate action hero movie. You're going to see this giant explosion taken from three different camera angles, and it'll be slow-mo, and you'll see in 3D all the elements of the stone come flying by, and then as the dust settles, you know, step out of the tomb, you know. That's not exactly what happened. I love how Jesus announced that it was accomplished. He did it invisibly. He did it silently. He did it quietly. He did it one by one and small group by small group. I think if he hadn't done it that way, we would have all been so absolutely blown away that we wouldn't even have been able to handle it. Jesus, our ultimate action hero, even in victory, is so gentle and kind because he loves you as an individual so much. How he introduces himself to you is such a loving and kind way. I'm just blown away myself. Well, let's look at chapter 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was over. Now, if you remember, the Sabbath was approaching. Sundown on Friday began the Sabbath, and not just any, but one of the high Sabbaths of the year because it was also Passover. Nothing could be done between sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. So all the preparations for Jesus' burial had to have been made before then, and we know that uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus had taken the body of Jesus Christ down from the cross. They had wrapped it in linen. They had placed spices, aromatic spices around the body. And then they had laid it in um, Joseph's new tomb in the, we, we call it the garden tomb. Uh, but there it was in the garden, and then that was it. There was nothing more that could be done. So here you have all of the disciples fearing for their lives wondering after this Sabbath is, is over, when is the next shoe going to drop? When, the, when is the other shoe going to drop? And when, is, when are the religious leaders and Pilate going to start coming after the followers of Jesus? So you have to understand the fear that is facing these men and women after the burial of Jesus. And don't you hate it when you have to wait? Isn't that the worst thing? you know that letter from the bank is coming. You know that the summons is arriving. You know that your boss is calling you in. You know that the doctor is going to deliver some news that you may not want to hear when your appointment arrives. But there's that space of time between when you know something bad has happened and when you get the news, when you find out what the other shoe is. The Lord oftentimes does his best work in our lives in those interim periods. It's then that we feel that we have gone to our lowest, but it's there where the breaking occurs. 
And God's Spirit can kind of just begin to sift into our lives, to filter down into those broken places, and He can say, I want you to know that even in this dark time, I am with you. And that, and we'll talk more about this as we go through this, that nothing can happen to you outside of my will. Even though it seems horrible, it's really for my good. So here during this period of dread, it finally ends. And when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought, bought spices so they could go and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb at sunrise. So the moment that they could see, and remember, of course, there weren't street lights. They didn't have flashlights. They had to wait until it was light enough. So they actually went out before, and, um, before it was even light, and they made their way to the tomb. Now, we don't know whether they bought the spices at that time, very early in the morning, or perhaps they bought them before sundown on Friday, but they had spices they were going to bring to the Lord. And the body of Christ had already been anointed and wrapped and prepared for burial. So this was akin to us taking flowers to a grave. They're, they're coming with these aromatic spices uh, to bring to uh, decorate, really, the grave of, and the body of Jesus Christ. But the women faced three problems. The first was that the religious leaders had asked Pilate to place a guard over the tomb. Why? Because Jesus had said, after three days, I'm going to rise. Now, here's an interesting sort of dichotomy here. We have the men and women who were the disciples of Jesus Christ hold away in fear, re thinking that the worst is going to happen, not thinking at all about what Jesus had told them. Over here, you have the religious leaders who hated Jesus, wanted to kill him, succeeded. What are they worried about? Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead. And they're like, well, we've got to stop it. We have to stop him from being able to rise from the dead. So how are we going to do that? We're going to put a guard on the tomb. That's going to do it. If we keep him from being able to roll that stone away, then that'll be it. You know, never mind their thinking is totally flawed. But Pilate said to him, you've got a guard. You go make it as secure as you know how. I wonder if there was a bit of sarcasm in Pilate's words there. So the guards were there. And they weren't anything that three women could deal with. They couldn't overcome a group of guards. No way. So that was problem number one. Problem number two was that stone. As I mentioned, when we looked through the crucifixion account, the stones, they were quite large um, and very, very heavy. And they rolled downhill in a trough to secure the front of the tomb. So you could never lift that stone by yourself, even if it was on flat ground, but having to roll it up a hill was extremely difficult. Certainly, three women could not accomplish that or even think that they could. And then the third problem that they faced was that the body of, of Jesus had, would have already have begun to decompose after this period of time. And yet, they came. Yet nothing stopped them. They loved Jesus so much that nothing would stand in their way. And it begs a question for us. Are there things that stop your pursuit of Jesus? Are there barriers, like what your friends or your family might say if they found out that you were a pursuer of Jesus. I was reading, um, we were actually on, on a very well-known book-selling website. And we were looking for some books to buy for our granddaughter. And there's a very famous set of books, uh, The Berenstain Bears, that you may have heard of. Uh, I didn't realize Jan and Stan Berenstain were born in 1923. I don't think Stan is with us anymore. But his son, Mike, is helping mom continue the series. Mike's a Christian. <clears throat> and so a lot of the new Berenstain Bears books are things like the Berenstain Bears and the Golden Rule. I love it. 
What I didn't love was the fact that in the comments on that well-known book selling website, a lot of parents were saying, I'm offended by this book because I want to raise my children in a completely secular way and I don't want to have anything to do with Christianity. And I thought, oh, how sad is that? Where has our culture come? What has happened where people no longer pursue Jesus, they actually are offended by him? But it is exactly what Jesus said would happen. He said that because of me, people will stumble. People will be offended. And so I wonder, in the case of these families, what is it that stopped their pursuit of Jesus? What barrier was it? Could it be that our culture has become secularized? That it's no longer a good thing to go to church, to love Jesus openly? And so that's something that keeps them from pursuing Jesus. It might be because you worry about things Jesus might ask you to give up. Well, I won't be able to do all those things I do with my friends anymore. My answer to you on that is, if you fall in love with Jesus, you're going to only want to do the things that will put a smile on Jesus' face. You're not going to want to do those things anymore. It's not anything that you're going to be forced to give away, give up, kicking and screaming, I can't party hardy anymore. You're not going to want to. What if he asks me to do something I'm not comfortable with? Well, you know, that is actually part of the Christian life. <laughs> but let me tell you this. When God says, I will work all things together for good, He means that. And that means good for your life. And those things that make you uncomfortable and might make you shrink back from your pursuit in Jesus, of Jesus may be the very things that God is putting His hand on in your life to say, I want to bless you. I want to make you someone that you will be proud to be because it'll be someone more like me. Yeah, you're uncomfortable now, but let me have that discomfort and let me change it into peace, my peace. The peace, he says, that passes understanding. In other words, you're not going to get it, but you can trust him with it anyway. So if you're, if you're considering Jesus, Think about this. How much did he pursue a relationship with you? How far did Jesus come? How much did Jesus give up? How much scorn and ridicule did he undergo? How much discomfort did he experience? All because he loved you so much. He was willing to give it all so he could give it all to you. He loves you that much. And I think it's worth leaving anything behind for that kind of love. So they come very early in the morning, verse 2. On Sunday, they went to the tomb at sunrise. Now the three recognize that they cannot roll the stone away. In verse 3, they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb for us? I love that. They aren't, they aren't saying, like I could say, you know, Mary saying to Mary, Hey, Mary. Yes, Mary. You know, there's no way we're going to roll that stone out of the way. Why are we doing this? What were we thinking? Nothing like that. They're just going along. They're driving toward the tomb. It's dark, right? The, they can hardly even see anything. And all they're saying is, gee, I wonder who's going to roll the stone out of the way. I love this. The faith that these women had. They were on a mission. Nothing was going to stand in their way. And it didn't matter if there was this massive stone. They're just going, gee, I wonder how God's going to show up and answer our prayer in this situation. Don't you love that? How often do we come into situations where we feel like God has called us to do something, but we look at the stone that stands in the way, that barrier that can just is immovable. And what we say is, well, God, guess you didn't want me to do this. When in fact, what we could say is, wow, this is really cool. I wonder how God's going to come through in this situation. Now, what we have to realize, of course, if, if you would ask them, okay, how could God answer your prayer? They might say, well, somebody could come along and tell the soldiers that there had been a robbery down at the 7-Eleven and they needed to go and take care of that. And then some other guys might come along, even though they're trembling in fear, uh, they could suddenly get courage and come out and they could help us roll it out of the way. 
we come up with ways we think God should answer our prayers in these difficult situations. Does God answer in those ways? Sometimes, yeah. But oftentimes, it's something totally different. Like in this case, it says, looking up in verse 4, uh, the, the, the tomb was on a hillside, so they were coming up, and they're looking up at the tomb, and you know, it's a little bit dark still probably. It says, they observed that the stone, and Mark makes a point of saying, which was very large, had been rolled away. They didn't need anybody to come out and help them do it because God came and helped them out himself. We know from um, Matthew's gospel that there was an earthquake and that an angel had actually come down and had rolled the stone out of the way and was sitting on it. Take that, you stone. <laughs> Oftentimes, we think we can prescribe to God how he will answer a difficult situation in our life. And what we need to realize from this are two things. One, we just need to have the faith to say, God, I'm moving forward. I'm waiting to see how you're going to move and I'm going to rejoice in it. And then when he does move, we need to recognize it. Being in that situation, the women could have said, okay, we got to, here's what we're going to do. We can't go to the tomb because the stone's in the front of it. So Mary, you go raise Peter and John. Mary, you go uh, rob the 7-Eleven so we can get the guards out of the way, and I'll stand guard, or something like that. You know, we, we come up with these answers that we think that, that uh, should be the way God does it, but we need to recognize when the Savior has moved the stone out of the way. It may not be in any way that you think it was going to happen. It may not seem to be an answer at all. And yet we know for those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, when you ask, He hears and He answers. Every time, it just might not be the way that you were expecting, and that's okay. So verse 5, <clears throat> when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. They were amazed and alarmed. A young man in a white robe, Matthew and, uh, uh, this is an angel, by the way, Luke says that there were two angels. Matthew and Mark says there were one. So how does that work? It's just different accounts based upon different eyewitnesses and, and different sources that they had. And Matthew and Mark seem to focus on the angel that speaks. So maybe there was one that was silent and one that spoke, so they only focused on the one that spoke. This actually happens occasionally in the scriptures where we have the differences in the number of people that were around. I like the fact that, that in, in uh, the, the ladies' minds, or the ladies' eyes, the, the guy appeared just as a, a young man sitting there in a white robe. Oftentimes, uh, angels, when they appear to us, do take on human form. However, usually when someone sees an angel, what happens? Uh, it says here that they were alarmed and <coughs> They were amazed and alarmed, but most people, they fall down like they were dead. They are in abject terror that the glow from the angels itself is just incredibly frightening. People don't know what to do when they see an angel. But here for Mary and Mary and Salome, they just saw him as a young man sitting there on the right side dressed in a, in, a long white, or in a long white robe, and they were amazed and alarmed. I guess it depends on what side you're on. Because this same angel appeared to the guard that the religious leaders had put in front of the tomb. And they fell down like dead men when they saw this angel. I'd rather be on God's side myself. <laughs> So verse 6, don't be alarmed, he told them. I like it. Don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He's been resurrected. He's not here. See the place where they put him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. So first the angel puts them to rest. They were alarmed. The angel says, don't be alarmed. This is oftentimes almost always what an angel has to say to someone uh, when they come into contact with them. You're alarmed. Don't be. Okay. 
moving along. So then he has to tell them they're at the right tomb. Don't you think maybe they were beginning to wonder? Because from a human standpoint, none of this is making any sense at all. Stone rolled out of the way. The tomb is empty, you know, backing up. Wait a minute. Is this the right tomb? Am I in the right place? But the angel says, yeah, you're at the right place. This is where Jesus was. But he's not here. He's not here. They, he has been resurrected. See the place where they put him, he says. Now notice what he says. He's been resurrected, not resuscitated. That's a different concept altogether. <clears throat> um, Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead just a few weeks before this, he was resuscitated. Lazarus would have to die again. Jesus was resurrected, and the Bible tells us he was the first fruits. He was the first one to be resurrected, which means he has been given life, will never end. He's going to take that same resurrection life and he's going to give it to us who have relationship with him. And the resurrection is the main difference between Christianity and any other religious system that we have in the world today. Others may have great precepts and philosophies, but none have God becoming human, dying for his people, and then raising from the dead, proving that the sacrifice of Jesus took. And then Jesus giving that same resurrected life to those who belong to him. All the other religions and philosophies in the world all depend on us doing something, us being something. This is the only one, Christianity is the only one where God did it all for us in the person of Jesus Christ as our ultimate action hero. So the angel t tells the, the women to go tell, I love it, go tell the disciples and Peter, Pete, buddy, you know, I told you I was coming back. I told you I would go before you to Galilee, but apparently you weren't listening very carefully. So he, the angel sends a little reminder along with these ladies to go tell the disciples. Now, in Luke's gospel, it says when they did it, nobody believed them. And um, we'll see that here in a second, too. But they, that uh, afterwards, Peter and John decided they would have a little foot race to the tomb to kind of see for themselves. So there must have been some curiosity. But they didn't go to Galilee. Had they had, you know, complete faith and trust in what the Lord was doing, they would have said, okay, I'm afraid, but Jesus said, I'm going to raise on the third day and I'm going to meet you in Galilee. So boys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to wait here and then we're going to go to Galilee. That is not what they did at all. They just quaked in fear. They stayed behind locked doors. They weren't going anywhere. So Jesus said, all right, you ain't going to Galilee. I'm going to come to you. And he did in a rather dramatic fashion. In fact, um, we don't actually see it here in this gospel, but we know from the other Gospels that, uh, that Jesus actually just suddenly appeared in the room. And of course he had to say, peace be to you, because otherwise they would have been dead on the floor too, or at least, you know, acting like it. So, <laughs> he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you. Verse 8, so they went out and started running from the tomb because trembling and astonishment overwhelmed them, and they said nothing to anyone since they were afraid. Believe it or not, this is where Mark's gospel ends. You're going, uh, Pastor Tom, have you read on? There's a verse 9. Well, that's probably not part of Mark's original writing. This is where Mark ended. Now, I don't, we don't really know why it was, um, my guess is that his editor was on, on his case to get, you know, he passed his deadline, his contract was up at the publisher, and he said, you better get me some words today, Mark. And so Mark quickly writes to him. No. No, not at all. But uh, it is most likely the end of Mark's gospel right here. Uh, verses 9 through 20 were probably not part of the original autograph. Most ancient manuscripts don't contain these verses. And the early church fathers indicated that Mark ended here in verse 8. But beginning in the second century, 
Various different people added various different endings to Mark. So it's kind of like one of those stories, have you ever read, make your own ending? Have you ever seen those before? You're looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, it's kind of those make your own ending books. And I've read some of the different ways that uh, others suggested that Mark uh, ended, and there, some of them are pretty interesting. I I'm, I'm, can see why they didn't make it into uh, what we call the canon of scripture. But this one that we have here is here because it was the most popular and because it was mostly extracted and excerpted from other books like the other Gospels and the Book of Acts. So we're going to go through it briefly, but just know that this is probably where Mark uh, ended his Gospel. It says they went, you know, they went out and started running from the tomb. I love it. Uh, they were trembling and astonishment had overwhelmed them and they said nothing to anyone. Well, how does that jive with the fact that they went and told the disciples? Well, either this means they, they didn't talk to anyone on their way, or it could mean they just said we're so frightened they didn't say anything and then they realized later, oh, you know, the angel told us to go to the disciples, so I guess that's what we should probably do. And so they basically changed their mind. But let's go on into verse 9 here. Early on the first day of the week, after he had risen, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and reported to those who had been with him as they were mourning and weeping. Yet when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it. Uh, the fact that Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene, it really should be encouraging to us because Mary was a woman, she was a sinner, and she came from a troubled past. She was a, in the lower echelon, very, very low in that society, and yet Jesus chose her to appear to first. That is encouraging to me because, you know, no matter how low you think you are, how undeserving you feel you are. Jesus is willing to come personally to you and extend to you the hand of salvation. Now, such was her devotion to Jesus that she was going to be there even when everyone else left. And we know from the accounts in the other Gospels that she thought that he was the gardener. And she said, where have you taken him? I'm going to go and get him. Mary was going to go and lift a dead weight of a full-grown Jewish man by herself. That's how much the pursuit of Jesus meant to Mary. But of course then Jesus turned to her and said, Mary, there was something about his voice. There was something about his words where she realized who it was. And that is so wonderful because there is something about the word that Jesus speaks. And John's Gospel tells us that Jesus is the word. There's something about the word that drives through doubt, it drives through grief, it drives through unbelief, it drives through pain, and drives through our feelings of being unworthy to realize that he is going to come to us no matter what state we are in, and he's going to say, I want you, and I'm going to do it all for you. Just like Mary, would you just reach out and grab a hold of me? She grabbed onto him like there was no tomorrow. And I could, you never, you ever have um, uh, your kids, like when my, when my kids were little, um, they would come and grab onto your leg. Have you ever had them do that before? And you're going, you know, I can't walk. <laughs> I kind of feel like that's what Mary probably did. But isn't that what we ought to do to pursue Jesus so thoroughly that it's like, I'm going to hold on to you, and I'm never letting go. So then in verse 12, then after this, he appeared in a different form to two of them walking on their way in the country. We know this is the story in Luke chapter 24 of the two guys on the road to Emmaus. They had heard about the empty tomb, but were leaving Jerusalem. They were going the wrong way. And, and I love it. You know, they're just in their grief. They're, okay, they're, they're the Eeyores of the group of people. <laughs> We're leaving Jerusalem. Jesus is dead and now his body's gone. 
Again, a free translation of a Greek <laughs> word. Yes. <clears throat> but in that story, they're walking along the road to Emmaus, right? It's just a little town not too far from Jerusalem. They're going on their way, probably, you know, do, 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 do. They're all down and out. Jesus comes along and he goes, Sup, guys? And they say, Haven't you heard? Where have you been, buddy, you country bumpkin? Haven't you heard what's been going on? And Jesus says to them, Oh, you of little faith, why didn't you believe all the scriptures that said that he would die and then be raised from the dead? And it says, beginning from that point, as they're walking along the road, Jesus shared with them all the scriptures in the Old Testament that had to do with Jesus and the Messiah. And I would just love to be able to get the podcast of that Bible study, wouldn't you? But they don't have it on iTunes, I looked. <laughs> so then, as they were sitting, they invited Jesus to stay with them. And then the story ends with Jesus breaking bread. And it was at that moment uh, where their eyes and their heart were open and they realized who it was. So we have Mary, who recognized Jesus from his word. And then we have the two men on the road to Emmaus who recognized Jesus when he did something that they recognized, the breaking of the bread that he had done on, during the Last Supper when he said, this is my body broken for you. So it's both the words of Jesus cutting through and it's also the actions of Jesus enlightening the heart to say, I have done this for you. And when then we recognize, yes, you were broken for me. You let your body die for me. And we too can pursue him. Like these, these guys on the road to Emmaus. Because after Jesus broke the bread, what happened? Bing! Jesus is gone. You know, he said, Scotty, energize. And he was gone. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> he just disappeared. And so then... These two guys came back into Jerusalem and they joined the chorus. You had Mary, Mary, and Salome, and Mary, and then you had the, the guys from, from uh, on the road to Emmaus. They said, we've just returned walking on the road to Emmaus. And look what happened to us. And it was just this overwhelming evidence of witnesses. You finally got to the disciples. And they finally realized, okay, something is going on here. Um, but it took a while. In verse 13, they went and reported it to the rest who didn't believe them either. Later, verse 14, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at the table. And look what it's, it records here. It says, he rebuked them, rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who saw him after he had been resurrected. You heard of Jesus the same way these guys did. It was through eyewitnesses of his resurrection who went and told somebody else, who told somebody else, who told somebody else. Some of those eyewitnesses wrote those things down and they came to us in the form of the Gospels. But that eyewitness is the way that you can reach out in faith to Jesus Christ. This is not a fairy tale. This isn't a made-up myth. This isn't just a great story that somebody decided to write. It's actual factual. And you can believe the eyewitnesses, even if the disciples didn't at first. Sometimes it takes a while. Then in verse 15, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Jesus, some people use this verse to say that if you're not baptized in water, you can't go to heaven. I think we misinterpret what this verse is saying here. Jesus said that those who will not go to heaven are those who do not believe. He doesn't say those who don't believe and aren't, or who might believe but aren't baptized. And one of the proof texts that we have to say that water baptism is not a prerequisite for salvation is one of the thieves on the cross with Jesus, right? 
uh, there was no water for baptism available. There was no baptismal there at the foot of the cross where Jesus could say, hey, Roman soldiers, hang on just a second. I got to bring this guy down and baptize him or he can't come into my heaven. Didn't happen. He, said, he turned to the guy who spoke to Jesus in faith and called out on him for his mercy. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. That being said, baptism is a very important thing. If you have not been baptized and you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you come and see me? Because we have baptisms around here at various different locations. We don't have a baptismal under the stage, but we uh, make use of some other bodies of water that we have here in the area. And I would love to baptize you. It is actually one of the most meaningful experiences that you can go through as a Christian. The water represents burial, with Jesus and then when you come out of the water it represents the resurrection into new life and it's just an awesome thing so this is the Great Commission go and preach the gospel that's what we're to be about as Christians become transformed into the character of Jesus Christ and then go uh, about sharing our eyewitness of what he's done in our lives to bring other people into the kingdom of God so verse 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new languages, they will pick up snakes. If they should drink anything deadly, it will never harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. <clears throat> this is a rather controversial section of Mark, and I think that there are some in the church that err in interpreting this particular verse here. Jesus said that there are signs that will accompany them. In what? In going around and showing off? No, in preaching the gospel. The signs were designed to authenticate the gospel and they actually did occur. But it wasn't because people decided, hey, these things sound pretty cool. I'd really like to look cool and impressive to people. So I'm going to go looking for these signs. That's not what it's about at all. It's not an experience. It's not power to wield for power's sake. In fact, in Acts chapter 8, verses 9 through 24, there was a man who saw the power of the Holy Spirit authenticating the gospel, and he said, I want to buy it now. How much? And he was rebuked heavily for that. It's not power for power's sake. It is power for a purpose. Jesus said, you will be imbued with power from on high. Why? To be my witnesses. The bottom line is God will give you everything you need to accomplish what he has set about for you to do in helping to further his kingdom. You don't need to really know anything more than that. You don't need to go about looking for demons to cast out or, heaven forbid, looking for snakes to pick up. And there is a group of people, I'm, I can't remember what they call themselves now. I want to call them snake charmers, but I know that's not what it is. I, uh, they, they actually liter literally will handle deadly poisonous snakes to show the power of God and how they can't be hurt. That is the stupidest thing I have ever seen. <laughs> and I tell you, I, I, I watched a 2020 report one time about snake handlers. That's what it is. And there was a, I cannot get the image out of my mind as much as I want to, but they, there was a segment of a guy that was handling uh, a snake, and it bit him. And the video stayed on the guy as he swelled up and died. It was horrible horrific and stupid and unnecessary and it didn't bring glory to God it didn't bring anyone into the kingdom of God so don't do it to people who want to wield the power of God to show off I would say to you the words that Jesus quoted to Lucifer when he wanted him to jump off the pinnacle of the temple Jesus said do not tempt the Lord thy God don't put the miracles in front put Jesus in front and if he needs to operate a miracle through you, great, no problem. Just make sure that miracle points back to the Lord and not back to you. And these things really did happen. Um, the, the casting out of demons, the disciples had done that. Jesus had given them the opportunity to do that. Um, the, uh, the picking up of snakes even. Uh, Paul, did when he was shipwrecked, you remember that on Miletus? And they came and... Uh, 
they, uh, they were collecting firewood. They were cold. They had just been shipwrecked, right? So they were just picking up firewood. La-di-da, here, I'll get some firewood. And it says that a, a serpent came out from the firewood. I guess Paul thought it, you know, it was cold. So you know what happens with those cold-blooded creatures. They get kind of, I don't know, hard or something. And maybe Paul thought, hey, this is a good stick. This will go well on the fire. <laughs> and it was a snake. <laughs> And it turned around and bit him, and then the people around said, ah, though he escaped from the sea, justice will not allow him uh, to escape, and he will, he will die because justice has found him out and all this, so they were watching him. <laughs> Nothing happened. What happened was that they gave glory to God because of it, and that's what's supposed to happen. Um, so... I'll just leave that right there. <laughs> Verse 19. Can you tell I'm a little passionate about this? I don't know. Verse 19. Then after speaking to them, the Lord Jesus was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word by the accompanying signs. And this is the event that took place in Acts chapter 1. Jesus spent 40 days among his disciples appearing at odd times and unexpected times and places, uh, in, in some instances before hundreds of people, all who saw Jesus can confirm 100% this is Jesus. I saw him. He was raised from the dead. And it's their eyewitness that was passed down to us. And I love it. And what he said to do was to just go out and make disciples, preach the gospel. It's what we're supposed to be about. So just in conclusion here, I wanted to talk a little bit back up about the resurrection because it really is the central part of Christianity. Without the resurrection, we might as well all just disband. There's no reason for us. Uh, in fact, Paul said, um, without the resurrection, we are the most to be pitied because here we are gathering together on a beautiful Labor Day weekend, wasting our time for something that doesn't exist. Ah, but it does. It is real. It really happened. So the resurrection is central to everything that we believe as Christians. What does it mean to us individually? Well, it means that what Jesus did as our individual ultimate action hero, it worked. Had Jesus not been resurrected from the dead, it would have shown that the Father didn't receive the sacrifice that he offered on your behalf. But because he was resurrected, it means God said, I'm clearing you of all your sins, forever blotting them out, and I will never remember them anymore. And they're as far as the east is from the west, and all those things we talked about last time in our study about what happened on the cross. It means that God's plan for salvation worked. Remember how I mentioned to you the guys on the road to Emmaus? They went through the Old Testament. They had this great Bible study, which Jesus would have given to them by heart because most Jewish boys ended up having the scriptures memorized and those that were more advanced would memorize it both in Hebrew and in Greek. So when these guys were talking about this Bible study, they did not have to bring a Bible with them. And Jesus went through all the Old Testament scriptures and showed how they all spoke of God's plan of salvation. God did not just make this up as he went along. God's plan of salvation worked. And what was that plan? It means that Lucifer no longer has dominion over you. It means that death can no longer claim you over your life or your destiny. The scripture says we are now more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. We're not just conquerors, people. We're more than conquerors. Death cannot hold us. Satan cannot rule us. God's plan has worked. And it really brings a new sense to tragedy. Earlier when I talked, before we started worship, about that one song, you know, Blessed Be the Name of the Lord, and how the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, but blessed be God's name. Um, knowing that Jesus came back from the dead means that nothing can happen to you that is not under God's control. And nothing can happen to you that he will not turn for his good if you just look for it if you just look for the ways that he's answering that prayer your circumstances actually might not change the only thing that might change might be your heart but that's really what god is after anyway it gives us a real witness christianity like i said is not just a nice set of principles and do-goodisms do-goodisms 
It's not the golden rule. It's not the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, the Sermon on the Mount was basically designed to make us feel as awful as possible because we know we can't measure up to it. But the, the resurrection brings us a real witness because there is the reality of a real risen Lord who really rules the universe and is really coming back for all those who belong to him and he's going to make a demarcation and he's going to say, all you who are with me, come on over here. You who don't want anything to do with me, you don't have to. You can go over here, but I must warn you, you will be leaving all joy, all peace, anything you have ever considered to be good, you will not find where you're going. He's real. He really rose. And you can tell people that. You can say, you know, Jesus rose from the dead. You do realize that, right? And you kind of have to deal with that. You got to make a decision. You're either, what is the old adage, you know? You're either for us or you're against us. You got you to decide. But it's a real witness. It's not just come and join my club and you'll feel better about yourself. And finally, it gives us real power over evil and over sin in our own lives. We no longer let, need to let sin have sway in our life. We have power to overcome sin. And we're not going to be perfect from the day that we accept Christ. But there's a process that's going to occur that's going to continually metamorphize us into his likeness. So I just want to leave you with this. Jesus came out of the tomb quietly. In a way, he kind of snuck up on everybody. And I think in a lot of ways, Jesus kind of sneaks up on us too. He doesn't come in, guns blazing, turn or burn, you better deal with me or I'm going to make you toast. Jesus kind of sneaks up on a person. You find yourself hearing about the gospel in a new way. You hear a Bible study of all things, and, you, and it talks about how God did all of this stuff for us, and you don't have to do anything. You just have to receive it. And maybe you found yourself thinking about him, considering the cross, considering the work that he did, considering the resurrection, and what, he, and what it means to you. Jesus is a gentleman. He's not going to fight his way into anybody's life. In fact, in the book of the Revelation, Jesus said, Behold, I knock at the door. It doesn't say, I come with my battering ram. I shall breaketh down the door to your heart, whether you like it or not. No, he just knocks. I love you. I died for you. I want you to be mine. And the book of the Revelation goes on to say, anyone who will open the door, he will come in, he will dine with you, he will fellowship with you, he will turn your life around. He's a gentleman. He'll never break in, but he loves to sneak up on people. So if you've been considering Jesus or if you're watching or listening at another time and place and, and you've been thinking about him a little bit, you can't stop for some reason. It's like, get that image out of my head. I can't stop thinking about Jesus. Maybe there's a reason. Maybe he's snuck up on you and he's knocking at the heart, at your heart. All he wants you to do is invite him in. It'll change your life. It'll change your destiny. It's the best thing I ever did. And I'm an eyewitness for what Jesus has done in my life. I'd be I don't even want to know what I'd be like without him. I don't want to find out. I never want to know because I do belong to him and I want you all to belong to him too. Let's pray. Father, I pray for all those that are here, all those that are listening, Lord, <clears throat> that you would sneak up on them too. You'd quietly come into their lives and that you would become everything that they need, their Savior, their Lord, it's a wonderful thing that you did. The resurrection is so incredible. We thank you so much for that that you have done for us so that we can forever praise and worship you. And Lord, I pray too this week for those of us who are in relationship with you that you would renew our pursuit of you knowing what you have done for us. 
Don't let there be anything that stands in our way of loving you no matter what others might think of us and of serving you no matter what it means because serving you is the best thing that we have ever done. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.